All right. Well, everybody's everybody's murmuring today. <laughs> I've been called a mother a few times myself. <laughs> not yet today, though. But not today. Not not so far today. It's early. It's early. It's early, early, early. Okay, I'm gonna do that a little bit better. It's a little bit too high. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There we go. Let's see what we got here. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What's up, y'all? Hello. <laughs> We're going to be, we want to welcome everybody that's online. Welcome to the course in miracles. Make sure I got this out right. Uh, now, if there's any need to do mama forgiveness, this is a good time <laughs> to do it also. It is the oh, thing to do. Today is a good day to do that too. Welcome, my dear companions online, as well as those uh, that are here. I'm Earl Purdy. We're doing Facebook Live. And we're doing a course in miracles, which is a course in right perception. Got a few extra books over there if you want to follow along at all. And we're going to be on page 236 today. And 236 is the section called Guiltlessness and Invulnerability. So let's take a breath. We're going to do guiltlessness and invulnerability from the course in miracles. So I want to get you to take a breath right now and listen to Brother John Christmas and use this time as an opportunity to get centered. Take a deep breath, relax. It's time for us to be in love's embrace. Yes. Misery loves company. That's what they always say. Must be the reason why I've always chose to stay. Remind yourself that there's a message especially for you today.
John Christmas at johnchristmas.com. You can download all of his music for free, actually. And he has a lot of great music that's based on the Course in Miracles. So we're going to be in a section that's called Guiltlessness and Invulnerability. And I'm going to go through the paragraph, and then we're going to try to see what is the instruction for us today, because I don't believe it's an accident that we're here. And uh, I need to hear some truth. Did somebody else need to hear those truths? Yeah. Yeah, and if you're here for the first time, there's only one rule to, to the Course in Miracles, and that's that you don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to welcome it. Some of it's going to be hard to believe. Some of it might be startling, but it says if you use it, you'll see that it works. So that's, that's pretty simple instructions as far as I'm concerned. And every now and then, smile. It makes me feel a little bit more in tune with y'all. So we get a little bit, there you go, now. Okay, all right. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm not your mama, you know. <laughs> okay. The Course in Miracles says, earlier I said that the Holy Spirit shares the goal of all good teachers. So your divine self, your higher self, shares the goal of all good teachers whose ultimate aim is to make themselves unnecessary. So I'm pretty good at making myself unnecessary as a teacher. That's what I've noticed over the years. And so my goal is to make myself unnecessary. And the goal of your inner teacher is to make itself unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So how do you make yourself unnecessary? Well, the Course says the way you make yourself unnecessary is you teach your pupils all that you know. So it's, do you know that we are pretty much the only species that hang on to our children their whole lives. <laughs> I mean really if you check it out if you check it out if you do check it out in nature, human beings are the only ones that will hang on to their children forever. Poor children. And and the truth is you're supposed to teach your children everything you know to the point that they don't need you anymore in that sense. Because they've gotten so much guidance from you, they know how to handle their own experience and take care of their life. So the Course is saying even our spiritual teacher, the Holy Spirit, has that exact same goal with us to teach us the truth to the point that we don't need to call on the Holy Spirit. And so he says the Holy Spirit, which is our true self, our loving self, wants only this, wants only what? To teach us everything that it knows. I've had people ask me, how can you tell when you're listening to the Holy Spirit? How can you tell when you're listening to your higher self? That's a good question. Here's the easy way you do it. Until you get to the point that you can hear your own inner guidance, the best thing you can do is get on a spiritual path, have a wisdom text that you believe in that feels right for you, and follow the guidance of that wisdom text. You follow the guidance of that wisdom text until you get to the point that you know what it's instructing you to do without necessarily having to look at it. I'm going to say this about five times because it takes about ten minutes to, to come into a, to the course. All right. So, for instance, I took the Course in Miracles as being the wisdom text that represented the voice of the Holy Spirit for me, right? So I studied it so that I could learn how a loving mind operates and according to the Course, how a mind that's fearful operates or how the loving voice within me operates versus the fearful voice in me. Because the Course teaches that 
basically we do not know the difference. And that's a biggie. It says you all don't know, because think about it, if you really knew the difference for between when you were really choosing for what was right or the truth for you and when you weren't, think about how many situations you wouldn't have gotten into in your life that you saw as being painful. So it's obvious we can make choices and don't know at the time that we're making the choice that's not the best choice for us. Then the Course says, then we turn around and we make up what the truth is, which he calls it, everybody saying they have their own truth. And the Course says, there's no such thing as everybody having their own truth. There's just everybody having their own perception of what the truth is. That that's what's really happening, is that there are many ways to get to the truth. There's one truth, but there's a lot of ways to get to it. So the purpose of the Course in Miracles is to teach you how to tell the difference between when you're using for the truth and when you're choosing something that's not going to give you what you really want. So it, so it says, well, what is the goal of the course of the Holy Spirit? Then to teach you everything that a loving mind would do so that you can be the love that you are without necessarily needing anybody to tell you what that is. So like for instance, the course has told me when you're in your ego and when you're in your fear-based mind, when someone's telling you the truth, then the tendency is to go unconscious, not hear it, analyze it, and focus in on something else. So the, the Course is saying the Holy Spirit only wants to teach you all that it knows because the Holy Spirit shares your Creator's love for you. So the Holy Spirit is the part of me that loves me, that shares, that really does, not fake love, like we talk, hear about fake news, but the real deal, all right? All right. Uh, just like there's fake news, the court says we do fake love. And fake love is a love that's based on guilt and bargains and scripts. You know, I'm going to make you feel guilty if you don't do what I want you to do. I do this for you if you do this for me. And I got a script for how you should be if you love me. So the court is saying that the Holy Spirit seeks to remove all guilt from your mind so that you might remember your creator in peace. So what is the purpose of your inner guide? Is to remove all guilt from your mind. Now, what's really a trip is, that simply means then, if I'm feeling guilty, am I listening to the mind in me, within me that reflects the truth, or am I listening in the mind, to the mind in me that reflects what's not the truth? question I'm throwing out to you. This is a smaller group. Let's talk. Okay. Okay. If I am, okay, so therefore, that's, so therefore now when you're telling yourself something and you feel guilty about it, what are you telling yourself? I'm, am I listening to something that's telling me the truth or not? I'm not. Okay, so then it becomes easy for me to go, okay, I'm feeling really, really guilty right now. I'm listening to the voice of my ego. I'm not listening to the voice for God. See how simple that was? But it's so simple that people won't tend to do it because they feel guilty a lot. So then it becomes, well, then you're telling me that I'm listening to the wrong voice all day, most of the time. And the Course is saying, you yeah. doggone, you are. <laughs> you are listening to the wrong voice. As a matter of fact, just look at the world that you're in and you'll realize that there's a lot of people not listening to the voice for love. That's not exactly hidden actually, right? So the Course then says, peace and guilt are antithetical or opposite. So if I'm feeling guilty, I'm feeling exactly the opposite of peace. And the Course says, the Father or God, love, your Creator, can only be remembered in peace. So if I really want to remember love, then I've got to have a peaceful mind. If I don't have a peaceful mind, I won't remember my creator according to this because I'm listening to the guilt. So if I'm listening to the guilt, I won't be feeling peace. So the Course says the purpose of the Course or any spiritual teaching or inner inner guidance is to remove all guilt from your mind so that you can remember your creator or love in peace. So I want to remember love. I'm tired of not knowing what love is all the time. So what is it I need to get rid of? I need to get rid of guilt. How do I get rid of guilt? Well, I won't listen to I won't listen to something that I don't believe is true. P 
people don't want to believe lies generally. Yeah. Now, the Course says the easiest person in the world to deceive is somebody who wants to be. So when you want to fool yourself about something, like, for instance, have you ever told yourself that somebody was in love with you and really liked you, even though it was like obvious that they didn't, but you really wanted to believe it, so you told yourself, so you made up stuff in your mind to tell yourself they really like you. What? Because you wanted to be deceived. So if you want to be deceived, it's real easy to fool you. So the Course in Miracles is saying, I want to help you not deceive yourself. And the easiest way for you not to deceive yourself is to know the difference between peace and guilt. So if I'm feeling guilt, I am not in peace. If I'm not in peace, I can't remember love, which is my creator, because love can only be remembered in peace. True love can only be remembered in peace. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the, the, the Christian terminology of the Course and also giving you what the Course in Miracles says that that stands for. So it's basically only talking about what? Love or fear. I say that every week because the ego part of the mind wants to make it complicated. So let's make it easy. It says love and guilt cannot coexist. To accept one is to deny the other. So it's no such thing as I love you and I'm feeling guilty. According to this. I'm, I'm always saying according to this. I didn't write it. I didn't make it up. I'm just saying what it said. So it's saying according to this. Uh, and I used to think that I loved the people the most that I made myself feel guilty about. And the Course would say, no, you're fearing the people the most that you're constantly making yourself feel guilty about. Because in that fear, you're saying, I'm afraid I'm going to lose that love. Mm -hmm. Fear, He says, fear is always fear of loss. So, so when people tell me that they're afraid, I always ask them, what is it that you are afraid of losing? So kind of finish that sentence. I'm afraid... So what is it that I'm afraid of losing? You know, if, I, if, if it's a bad, what I call a bad neighborhood, I'm afraid, why? I'm afraid of losing something, whether it's my life, or let's say I think somebody might try to rob me. There's always some form of the belief that I'm going to lose when I'm afraid. So the Course in Miracles says love and guilt cannot coexist. To accept one is to deny the other. Guilt hides Christ from your sight. So if we're saying we're only talking about love and fear, then we could say guilt has love from your sight. And you could also say guilt has your true self, which of course defines Christ as being your true self, your self that was created by the divine from your sight. Because guilt is the denial of the blamelessness of God's son. So guilt is me denying that I am blameless and that I am innocent. And so people say, well, you know, won't people go wild and do anything if they don't feel guilty about what they do? Yeah. And Spirit says, no, people are going wild and doing everything to each other because they feel guilty. It's just the opposite. Right. <clears throat> it's the way the world is in a very frightening place because of guilt and fear. So you can make a mistake, but a mistake can be gently corrected. So you don't need to feel guilty to not do to do the right thing. You don't need guilt to make you do the right thing. So before I go to the next paragraph, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say it one more time. Okay, here we go. The Holy Spirit in you has one goal. That's to teach you the truth to the point that you can go within to make that realization without the help of your higher teacher. The course then says that that the Holy Spirit is trying to remove all the guilt from our mind because when you don't feel guilty, that's when you remember God. That's when you remember love. It's no such thing as love coexisting with guilt. And so the Course in Miracles says, if I accept guilt, I'm denying love. If I accept love, it means I'm denying guilt. And it's guilt that's hiding my true self from me. And it's guilt that's keeping me from knowing I'm blameless and I'm innocent. So, any comments or any questions about that paragraph? Yeah. Yeah, I, I find being a person who seems to still love to throw guilt on myself that I'll go through something, I'll feel guilty, and then I'll start to maybe read the course or do something. Mm -hmm. And then I'll feel, I'll add another layer of guilt on about feeling guilty about feeling guilty, you know, about, mm -hmm. you know, um, about, you know, my guilt about not 
listening to God or my inner voice? It's not really a question. It's just kind of a statement. Mm -hmm. You know, the process mm -hmm. that I go through, I take mm -hmm. one layer of guilt and throw another one on top of it, recognizing mm -hmm. my intensity of still enjoying the feelings of guilt. But just think, and, and think about that for a second. I'm going to get rid of my guilt by feeling more guilt. Right. <laughs> Does that make any sense? No, it but, doesn't. But, 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 but isn't that what we attempted to do, though? I'm, I'm a good person, so I'm going to feel guilty about feeling guilty. So the Course is telling us that that doesn't make any difference. That's not complicated. All you got to do is go back to guilt and love can't coexist. So I don't care how much I pile it on myself. It still isn't love. See, that's yeah. um, like I heard Jason talking to somebody earlier today, and that person asked what people always ask. Well, how do I change my mind? Or how do I start? And I was, and he, he said the same way that you got into thinking the way you're thinking right now, through repetition, through what you keep, because you keep telling yourself that over and over again. So it's funny how people think that that they are going to change their mind without changing their mind and that they're going to change their mind without telling themselves something different. You know, it's like, what? That is no, there's no way that's going to work. But I want you to magically tell me something that's going to completely change my mind. Well, it's only going to completely change your mind if you tell yourself what I just told you. And you start telling yourself that instead of the other stuff that you always tell yourself. Just like what you said. That's, that's programming, right? right. That's your, your programming is guilt is the answer to everything. Right. So the minute you read, you say, well, I'm going to feel guilty about that too. So that's really not thinking any different. That's actually thinking the same way again. But it's, it's recognizing you know, it. If you, if you recognize it, then you're one step closer. Well, that's, to that's, that's the most important thing we can possibly do. It's just, most people don't recognize it. Like, a lot of times people say, well, okay, I recognize it, then what? I said, no, you're kidding yourself. You don't recognize it yet. You just heard me say that. You're not recognizing anything until you recognize it. And then you recognize it, you won't do it anymore. Oh, you know what I'm saying? There's a poison snake down there. Then you don't, then you, you recognize it and you go the other way. So it's no such thing as recognizing something and keep continuing to keep doing it. Keep doing it, right? So that's that's why I keep going over this over and over again. I'm literally retraining my mind. So uh, as you said, uh, fear is that representation of fear of something I'm going to lose, fear right. of something I've lost. And guilt is a belief that, and it's my fault. Mm -hmm. So what I what I got from this and especially as we go further in our awakening process as we go further in our development in a lot of ways love amplifies I mean fear amplifies as we pursue love That's because right. we start to recognize more and more how much we lost at our own hands yes and so yes. we have to be brought into recognition of but really you're innocent and that's what I hear in this is that recognition that you're innocent. This was part of your path. And, and a holy relationship is a relationship between you and I that I'm committed to helping you remember you're innocent. But I don't know about you, but it's been in my special relationships in the past that actually I felt the most guilt because the person was constantly blaming me for their unhappiness and not taking responsibility for it. So actually, it's like I'm in a relationship with somebody that's helping me forget love, helping me forget God, right. helping me forget who I really am. So that's that so that's what like mothers sometimes. <laughs> 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 that's right. That was a good loving Mother's Day thought, right? Yeah. <laughs> only mother could say something. Yeah, like yeah, that. only mother. <laughs> well, you know, people think, you know, it's like it's, how many times have you complimented someone and you told them that they were smart or they were beautiful or they or or, or something nice about them and they say and they say back to you, "Oh, you really are building my ego." Mm -hmm. That's really good for my day. We are so backwards that we think right. when we hear a loving thought, that's the ego, and you shouldn't try to right. let yourself right. receive that. But if someone says something what we call ugly to us, then we take that as being something we should take a look at. But if I tell you you're beautiful, you go, oh, you're just trying to build my ego. No. When I tell you you're beautiful, what I'm actually doing is reminding you of what and who you really are. I'm, I'm helping you not forget who you are. So a person that's constantly blaming you and seeing you as guilty is actually a person that's helping you forget the truth. 
of who you are. One of the things that I talk about in the class that I call Hardcore Course in Miracles is that what makes it hardcore is the profound simplicity of what I'm teaching. Because he says the simpler it is, the harder it is for us to hear it. Why? Because if it's simple and it's something you can do, then you have to really just be honest with yourself and tell yourself, I'm not doing this because I just don't want to. You know, I can no longer go, this is so complicated that I couldn't practice it. No. If, if we hear, every time you feel guilty, you're listening to the wrong voice. Every time you feel guilty, you're listening to the wrong voice. Every time you feel guilty, you're listening to the wrong voice. Every time you feel guilty. And the next time you feel guilty, the next time you feel angry, you cannot say you don't know that you're listening to the wrong voice. You just have to admit, I want to feel guilty. That's what you'd have to do if you were really being honest. You just have to say, I just want to feel bad right now. And somehow or another, I think feel, I'm going to feel so bad so much that I feel good. I'm going I'm to I'm feel bad myself into feeling good. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of insanity that the fearful mind does. I'm going to throw this over for five more minutes. I'm going to go to the next paragraph. So my continuing dilemma uh, during this whole time that I've been in the course, my continuing dilemma is, so I throw out these old ideas of what right and wrong is and what spiritual and what not spiritual looks like. But then how am I to know? Like, well, see, I, I don't know if that well, makes well, sense. Well, see, that's, that's, another, that's another trick of your mind. If you actually start seeing things differently, then you'll get the result, and then you'll know. See, it's, it's not like, it's, if, if I actually see you as Chris when I thought you were CJ, then I'll actually know you're Chris and not mm -hmm. CJ. Especially if someone told me you're Chris and not CJ. So at the point I actually apply what I've been told, then I see the result of it. See, it's, it's still the same thing. We want the result without actually doing what it's saying. So what you're doing is you're telling yourself you replaced your way of thinking, but you haven't replaced your way of thinking until you replace your way of thinking. So the Course said there's four stages to accepting the truth. There's four stages to accepting a new idea. They're simple, so let's tune in. It's going to be tough, all right? First you hear it, then you repeat it, then you keep repeating it while you seriously consider it with some <laughs> reservations, and then you finally accept it as true. That's how you accept any new ideas, through repetition. And, and that's one of the main compliments that I'll get from people who see the power of that. They'll say, Earl, what I appreciate the most about your classes and your sharings is that you repeat it over and over, where most groups just get together and start analyzing it. But they don't try to remember what they just heard. Like, for instance, whenever you're feeling guilty, are you feeling truth or illusion? Are you feeling love or not? Okay. So, okay. Uh, what's not true? Uh, if you're constantly hearing that you're guilty and you're telling yourself that you're guilty, would that keep you from remembering love? Yes. Would that, which is God. Okay, all right. So the next time you're trying to make yourself feel guilty, would that keep you unaware of love or make you aware that love is real in your life? Okay, then why would you continue to tell yourself that you're guilty once you've heard that? Or even if you were telling yourself you were guilty, you would be telling yourself, I'm telling myself something is not true. See, then I'm still not in denial. I'm saying, Earl, you're making yourself feel guilty. You're telling yourself something that's not true. That doesn't mean I immediately feel innocent. It means if I keep telling myself that long enough, then I'll stop. See, it's the repetition that brings about the transformation of the mind because most people don't know they're programmed like robots and what they are doing is just repeating what they were taught from the time that they were children. Like if you grow up like I did in a fundamentalist religious belief and you learn that, you will take whatever you have learned to the point that is a program. You will now think that is a fact. Mm -hmm. and, you, you, and you will confuse a belief with a fact. And that's what most people do. They confuse, 
I believe I'm sinful doesn't necessarily mean that's a fact. Any more than me saying I'm a rabbit would necessarily mean that that's a fact. But how could I really tell that really quickly whether or not believing that I'm a rabbit is a really incorrect idea. Well, I'd have a hell of a time hopping at the speed that rabbits do. <laughs> right? So then I would think something was wrong with me, right? I'm the worst rabbit that ever lived. I go to rabbit rehabilitation school. I, you know what I'm saying right now? Yeah, that's right. That, that's right. That's right. And so, and so the Course in Miracles, again, says a very profound, simple truth. The biggest clue that we all ought to have that our beliefs are not correct is the amount of fear, conflict, separation, hurt, sickness, attack, and death that we see. So the court says that a fear-based mind completely overlooks the obvious. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm in a relationship and we're constantly arguing, fighting, and and in conflict and attacking each other and projecting each other and blaming each other and I'm miserable, he says, that should be enough to let you know that something about what you're doing. But we're not like that. It's the weirdest thing. It's like we could be in total hell and misery and still go, I'm right. Right? We'll still do it. We'll be told. And then, and then he says, the trick is what we'll do is we'll then project on somebody else and then say they're the blame for the way that we're feeling because that's the way you guarantee you'll never do anything but suffer. I was having to talk with a relative of mine recently in Memphis and, and, and I was telling her but you know that that is very important for you to recognize that if you're making your happiness dependent on somebody else's behavior changing, you will never win. You're screwed. I don't care how justified you feel. I don't care. You know, if I make my happiness dependent on another race loving me before I will allow myself to have any peace, I will never be happy. Did you get that? Yes. But don't you see it all the time? And that's what he's telling us now, that if I'm going to be a successful teacher, then I'm going to give my pupils everything that I know until they get to the point I don't know that until they get to the point that they don't need me anymore, then how do you transfer that to every area of your life? Then as a father, I go, what? I'm going to teach my children everything I know until they, get, until they get to the point that they can be responsible for their own life because now I've taught them well enough to take care of themselves. We're not seeing that so much in our society anymore. That should be obvious that that's wrong-mindedness. You know, you shouldn't be, you know, 50 years old and still needing your mom in order for you to make it. Even though you're innocent, even though you're blameless, you're still cool. But something's a little awry, awry here. I'm old school from the old days. I couldn't wait to get out the house. And eight, 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 18 years old, I was gone. You know, it wasn't about wanting to stay. It was about wanting to go. Or when I was a kid, I couldn't stay in the house all day. My mother would kick us out the house. You got to go out. You got to go out. You can come back before the sunset. You know what I'm saying? And I was everywhere. She didn't know where I was all day long. And, and she was considered overprotective. All right. <laughs> I thought my mother was being overprotective. If, so in other words, I was, given, I was given a way of looking at things and I was taught and I was taught how to be independent and take care of myself. And they, they happened to actually, I saw this on the news the other day. They, had, they, they just passed a bill, and I think it was Utah, they called it the Free Range Children Act. Yeah. And what this bill is, which is unbelievable, I thought about chicken as soon as I heard it. But, but, what, I, but what, I, what blew my mind, do y'all know what that bill was? That bill was to protect parents who would do the stuff that we did all the time when we were growing up. So that if, a, yeah, if the, kid, if the parent lets the, chi the child walk a block to school, that, that it assures that their child won't be taken away from them because you're a poor parent, because you let your child do anything without you present. And somehow or another, we actually believe that that's ultimately protecting our children. Or catering to your child to the point that your child feels so entitled to receive everything without them giving anything or investing anything. Uh, and somehow believes that Somehow or another, you're helping your child by treating them like th that the world is going to cater to their every whim. And then that child goes out in the world after they've been completely spoiled by you. And, and, and they don't know how to handle anything. That's, that's what they say is one of the things that's killing free speech in college right now. Is all the children are so sensitive 
about everything having to please them that nobody can come talk to them because anything that they say that they feel the least bit offended by, they pick it and that person's got to be gone. So you can't produce, you cannot share any alternative viewpoints in colleges without everybody being in an uproar. But we think that that's a good thing. So again, uh, all that anger and all that guilt, is that a reflection of love or is that a reflection of fear? It's a, it's a reflection of fear. And he says right here, guilt and fear, that's what hides your true self from your sight. If I'm feeling guilty and angry and upset and insecure, I don't know my true love and self. I don't know my real self. Okay, so let's go to the next paragraph. I would much rather do one paragraph that... <laughs> I would rather do one paragraph that we could remember something that I've just said then cover six paragraphs that we won't remember any of it. Whose phone is that? No idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. it, it's guilt sort of like what you might call karma because if, if you're feeling guilt then you're feeling then you, you're understanding that there's a correction that needs to be made and while you're feeling it you're being guided to that correction. If it's only karma in the sense that the, the, uh, the law of cause and effect, and you reap right. what you sow. Yeah. So, if, so if I'm giving myself guilt, then it's a, it's a request for some type of punishment to myself. Right. So, if you want to look at it that way, but here's the trick, Peter. The trick is to remember that, regardless of where you think guilt came from, guilt got is not love. Right. Right. See, that's the only point it's trying to make. Guilt is not love. And you know when you're feeling guilty. Mm -hmm. So that's all it's trying to get us from. And what happens? If I feel guilty, I don't remember my loving self, and therefore I don't remember my creator who is love, what is love. And that's what I need to remember, that, that every time I try to make someone feel guilty, I'm actually trying to make them forget how loving and beautiful they are. Mm -hmm. That is actually an attack on them. And you attacking, feeling guilty is an attack on yourself. That's not the same as saying you can go out and do anything and be a sociopath and, and don't feel guilty about it. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that the person is a sociopath because they have guilt and they have hidden guilt, guilt they don't know about. But the point is, if I'm feeling guilty, I'm not experiencing love. That's it. What I, what I really loved about this the first time I heard it is that being raised to believe that guilt is normal and natural and, and good. Yeah. I didn't know what else there was. Right. So I, it, even, if, even though it didn't feel good, mm -hmm. I didn't know what my alternative was. That's right. And this told me what my alternative was. Thank you. So I could at least, okay, instead of just knowing that this is awful, but not knowing any other choice. That's right. Now there's another choice. That's what's good. That's what's so good to have a replacement, right? That's right. So I got a guilt-based way of thinking. What right. I need is an innocence-based way of thinking. And I couldn't find that on my own. And right, and that was what the Course in Miracles was for me. Yeah. For somebody else, it may be some other wisdom text. So I'm not saying the Course in Miracles is the only way. I'm saying the Course in Miracles was what inspired me to actually get off my butt and practice what I was reading, yeah. rather than it just be another book that I read and then I put it up on the bookshelf. And got another one. So I always tell people, your spiritual path, whatever it is, how you can tell it's your spiritual path is even though you feel resistance sometimes, you still do it. It's like when a person is trying to exercise or trying to lose weight. Of course I had resistance when I'm trying to lose weight and do exercise. But because of my goal, I keep going past my resistance because the goal is more important to me than the resistance that I have. And the Course of Miracles teaches that that's how you get past any obstacle that comes up in your life. It should be that the attraction of the thing beyond the obstacle pulls you past the obstacle. See, if I want to be in a loving relationship and there's something that comes up between us, my desire to have a loving relationship should pull me past whatever is coming up. We'll work through it. Why? Because I want to join. But if I don't want to be with you anyway and an obstacle come up, I'm out of here. Because I didn't really want to join with you anyway, so anything can stop me. Yeah. See, so the, so the minute you have anything, the minute something comes up and it stops you, you didn't never want to come in the first place. You didn't never want to do that in the first place. 
And so obstacles come up when you lose sight of the goal. Like there's a line in here, and I, and I have to bring other things into, from the course into the, to the class. There's a line here that says, so if you're reading the course and it seems contradictory and it seems paradoxical, and then he says, it's really not that the course is so much contradictory or paradoxical as you become afraid of the goal that the course is trying to achieve with you. So if I'm afraid of joining with God, if I'm afraid of joining with love, if I'm afraid of letting go of my guilt, if I believe seeing myself as sinful is the way to happiness or heaven, quote unquote, then I'm going to start to see everything about this book that would justify me not studying it. If I'm afraid of this book, I'm going to look at it in terms of what it's saying that I can disagree with. If I'm not afraid of what it's teaching, which is my basic sinlessness instead of my being guilty, then I'm going to keep going past the resistance that I get with the language, with the wording, and everything. See, Chris, is there still a part of you that's rooted in the idea because of your fundamentalist programming that somehow or another guilt and going to hell is, is very important to your salvation? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to continue to ask the same questions about everything that you read from the Course for years because it's a part of you that's afraid of what it's saying which is that you deserve love, you're innocent, you're blameless, especially if you think you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing or thinking something that you shouldn't be thinking, then it's going to trigger that earlier programming that says, if you're a good guy, Chris, you're going to see yourself as a bad guy. You're going to see yourself as a guilty guy. So, so therefore, I've learned that seeing myself as guilty if I do something wrong makes me a good person. And this book is saying I'm innocent then actually I'm not going to want to believe what this book is saying because I already believe it's through seeing myself as guilty that makes me a good person. And that's what we've been programmed. Right. Have, you ever, have you ever had somebody that was upset with you and you said, I don't feel guilty about what happened? <laughs> you know, and watch them go ballistic. <laughs> they want you to say you feel guilty. They want you to say you feel really horrible and you're a bad person. That's what they want. That's why uh, if you're talking to a person that's fear-based and you want forgiveness, it, you actually have to say, I want you to forgive me for the pain that I caused you. Then they might entertain what you just said. <laughs> but if they think forgiving you is letting you off the hook for what they believe you really did to them, then they're not going to want to forgive you. They don't, they don't realize what it's doing for them. They think it's letting you off the hook. So they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So we ask, again, how's that working for you? Mm -hmm. That's why I always ask people. It's because you're still mad at your ex-husband, you won't let yourself have a new one. How's that working for you? Because, you know, you're just punishing yourself through that grievance. You're the only one that's suffering. And people that have been around me a long time have heard me say this a million times. Visualize the person you're holding the grievance against so much that you won't let yourself have any fun now or be open to any other relationships. Think of that person being in Hawaii on a beach partying their butt off right now, not the <laughs> least bit aware that you are still holding grievances that keep you from having any fun. You're really fixing them aren't you? <laughs> right? You really are hurting them a lot. And, and I used to do that kind of stuff, you know, not let myself have my next beautiful relationship because of what I thought happened in the last one. And somehow I think I'm hurting that person because I won't open my heart anymore. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So I just want to say one quick comment. Yeah. Because, yeah, you're right about, like, like my own program. But I have hope because there's something in me that keeps bringing me back, that keeps having me read the course and when I'm actually, there's, so there's something in me that loves me more than the programming that keeps me coming back. Now notice that you're, t now you're saying the loving thing about yourself yeah. after I pointed out the crazy thing. Yeah. about th That's what always happens. If I point out to you, if I say, Chris, you got a lot of guilt and you're acting from a lot of guilt, 
you really believe in guilt too much and you got too much belief in sin, then it's going to trigger the part of your mind. Oh, you know what? I'm not that bad. I'm really coming and I'm really trying to be more loving and more, you know, that's what we do, right? Yeah. So that's what's so cool about being honest about your ego. If you tell the truth about your ego, you find yourself immediately going beyond the two. Oh, you know, I'm really not that bad. I'm really working on the truth. That's why I encourage people in my circle to go ahead and say what they feel the way that they feel it. Don't try to give me, don't try to, uh, you know, give me all the positive things that you're thinking first. Tell the truth about what you're telling yourself that's not the truth. And right behind that, you'll see the truth about yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if I say to you, Chris, you're blameless as snow. You, you're totally innocent. You're totally sinless. You're totally guiltless. You're a great person. You're the most kind, un unconditionally loving person ever met. You are so innocent. The, 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 what the average person will go, well, I'm not really that innocent. You don't really know who that is. <laughs> you don't know. We, we, do, we, we do just the opposite. We do just the opposite. That's what I've noticed in counseling. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You could be in counseling and a person be telling you every critical thing that they could possibly tell you about their mate. And then you go, yeah, that person did, you know, they were really painful. They were really mean. They were, well, he's not really that bad. He bought me a tulip five years ago. You know what I'm saying? They'll, they'll, they will immediately go to the, the same person they were just condemning when I agree with, oh, that really wasn't loving. They go, well, you know, that the ego is the part of the mind that always takes the opposite point of view. It's always the part that takes the opposite point of view. Jason. What this reminds me of is, we, I've been taught, I know in my experience that, now that I'm a certain age and I'm an adult, I should be fixed. I should have this fixed mindset and already know everything and already have this fixed belief system. But when I think back as a child, I used to believe in fantasies and, and, and fairy tales as a child, but I didn't feel guilty or demean myself for having those belief systems. That's right. But now I think I should be fixed in this belief system. And so if something shows me that my belief system is wrong, then I'm bad. Right. Versus realizing that I'm still growing. I'm still growing. And still learning. Well, it's, it, people don't even want to plug into the how helpful it is to see yourself is t insane. Yeah. yeah. I've been playing around with that this week. Since is that right? That last week. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah. I'm like, I'm totally insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the Course in Miracles says that actually we, it gives us a compliment. It says we're partially insane. <laughs> you know, if you can listen to reason. He says a partially insane being can listen to reason. A totally insane being doesn't listen to reason at all, and they just act from their emotional reactions and responses, yeah. right? Have you ever been talking to a person and you say, I can't reason with you. You try to use any kind of reason, you lose them all. Day. Okay, that's totally insane. Yeah. But if, we, if I was to look at it as if I have some insane thoughts and I've learned some insane things, I'd be more gentle with myself. Yeah. Because we've been programmed. You know, people can murder people and they'll say, they did it by reason of insanity and don't punish them as harshly mm -hmm. as they do people who think they think who had did it in their sane mind. So even in our distorted society, we will try to give me people who are mentally ill a break if they do something. Mm -hmm. And so the cause is saying, let's work with that idea. You mentally ill. Yeah. <laughs> Look at yourself as being mentally ill and that you need mental healing and you'll be more gentle with yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? So my ego doesn't want to call me mentally ill. People will be much more willing to tell you that they have a, a physical condition, that something's wrong with their stomach. Then they'll tell you, I just went to a psychiatrist because I'm mentally ill and he's working mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. me. We'll have much more shame about, shame about mental illness mm -hmm. than we do about physical illness, mm -hmm. which is a shame, really. Because well, it drives people, those you know, people underground, then. It well, drives them, it drives them well, into hiding, and it's just, I think it increases their guilt. Well, but it, yeah, but when you think in terms of how you would respond to your mistakes, if you realize there was an error and in insanity in what you've learned and what you thought, you let it go faster. See, you hang on to a belief system that you think is true, but the ones you really get that it's insane to believe you could do something that God couldn't correct. That's insane. It's insane to think you could do anything and infinite intelligence could not heal or correct. The only reason why a person would want to believe that is because they want to be punished or they want somebody else to be punished. Mm. Okay. Then it says, in the strange, I love this, he says, in the strange world that you have made, <laughs> you, the son of God or the child of God, has sinned. Now, what does that mean? Well, 
in the strange way we look at things, we do believe that we are guilty or we are tempted to believe that we have really sinned. But notice it says, in the strange world you have made. So in this strange world, yes, it does look like you are guilty or it does look like you have sinned. He says, so, I love it, he says, so how could you see the child of God then? By making the child of God invisible, the world of retribution rose in the black cloud of guilt that you accepted and you hold dear. This book can say one more things in one sentence to make you what the hell did you just say? Um, let me, let, let's go to the simplicity. Um, I am innocent. You see me as guilty. I am innocent. I see me as guilty. So I am invisible. Then it says, uh, and in, by making me invisible, in other words, by seeing you as guilty and seeing me as guilty, the world of retribution rose in the black cloud of guilt that I accepted. Because I think I'm guilty, because you think you're guilty, now we see a world that it looks like retribution and punishment is all around us. Because we believe guilty people deserve what? To be punished. So this whole world that we see based on guilt and punishment came because we no longer saw each other as innocent and loving. Yeah. See, that's... And he says, what the key, what's the key word of the last part of that sentence? And you hold it dear. We see, cherish the black cloud. We yeah. cherish the guilt. That's what you were just saying. You know, I, I not only want to... I no, I'm not only seeing you as guilty, guess what? I don't want to see you as guilty. I want to see you as being the cause of my pain. I want to see you as guilty. So as long as I want to see you as guilty, I'm going to be in a world where it looks like punishment and retribution are all around me. And like I said, I'm going to finish it and I'll give you a chance to share what comes to you. And then it says, for the blamelessness of Christ... The blameless, the blamelessness of your true self as love and an extension of love in God is the proof that the ego never was and never can be. Ego is just another term for guilt and guilty man, fear and fearful man, because the book is only talking about love or fear. So why is it written this way? Why doesn't it just say guilt? Because to study this book, you got to focus. Mm -hmm. See, it's not just another book that you can go speed read it, throw it on the shelf. Because all of us know how to read. So all of us can read without comprehension. All of us can read without comprehension. So yeah, it could be in plain language and you can make it like any other book that you read in plain language. Or you can go, what the hell? Did that, what? And then you, then you dig in and you go, oh, do you, that means that, that, that means that if I see your innocence, your blamelessness, then your guilt never was. Your, your, your ego never was. Your ego is just a concept you have of yourself that you're living by. That's it. If I have a concept of myself that I'm sinful and guilty, then I am going to live according to that idea. I'm going to make myself feel guilty. I'm going to stay angry, and I'm going to punish myself all the time. What would be some great ways for me to punish myself if I thought I was guilty? Uh, I could not have enough money to live off of. I could keep myself sick in some way. I could have jo a job that I hate. I could have friends that I don't like. I could live in a city that I can't stand. I could be driving a car that I don't even want to look at it before I get inside of it. In other words, I'll give myself a life that it seems like I'm constantly dissatisfied and unhappy about one thing or another. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Okay, it won't be necessarily somebody walking up on you on the street and saying, you are guilty and you deserve to be punished. It'll be, no, my child, in the way I'm dealing with my child, could be my punishment. Or my child could be used as a way for me to recognize my blamelessness and my innocence. My job could be something I punish myself about, or my job could be something I feel totally fulfilled doing. See, I'm not punishing myself through what I do for a living. 
You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, so it's if you believe in guilt, you're not going to let your have, yourself have satisfaction because that's part of the punishment. Mm -hmm. So to look like I'm always having the relationships that doesn't work, and I'm always having financial challenges. Those are just all forms of what happens in the strange world that's based on retribution, punishment, and guilt. So the court says, without guilt, the ego has no life. Like people go, how can I get rid of my ego? How can I get rid of my fear? How can I get rid of my ego? All you have to do is support your guiltlessness and your innocence the way you used to support your guilt. Mm -hmm. That's all. See, that's profoundly simple. It's, it, it's so profoundly simple, people would much rather make it more complicated than that. I'll say it again. You want to get rid of your fear? You want to get rid of your ego, Chris? Then what you want to do is allow yourself to have perceptions that teach you that you are not bad, guilty, and sinful. Isn't that complicated? No. But why don't I do it consistently? Because I still believe guilt is somehow or another going to serve me and make me a good person. Because that was the belief I got as a child. So when a person starts to get on the path of enlightenment, then they're going back in time. And they're re-perceiving all of their early beliefs. So you there be a point on your spiritual path that you will be confronting the earliest beliefs that you got when you entered this world. Right. So whatever that first belief was, whether you were taught you were guilty and sinful, you'll be back mm -hmm. right looking at that belief. And that's when it'll seem the strongest again, because that's the earliest idea you got about yourself. And so you find that'll be the hardest one to let go of because your whole world has been built mm -hmm. around that idea. So the court says you actually become afraid. It says you actually feel like you're going to die. Mm -hmm. That's how deep it'll be. You feel like you're going to die if you let go of this belief. Mm -hmm. That's how you know you've done such good work that you're back to your earliest belief, mm -hmm. which means you've actually been very successful on your spiritual path. Mm -hmm. and, so, and people think it's just the opposite. I'm more afraid than ever. I feel my guilt more than ever. Yeah, because... You're finally looking at your earliest beliefs that you built your whole world around. That's why it says do it with the Holy Spirit. Do it with your loving self, your divine self, because alone it'll just scare the hell out of you. Like a little kid that's terrified at night. And I, when I was a kid, they had the blanket over me because I was scared of the boogeyman. It was my mama that came in and said, ain't no boogeyman. I'm here. You're safe. I couldn't take myself out of the fear. You can't take yourself out of this fear. You need help. The help of the divine. The help of God. So, any questions or comments about that paragraph? Well, I thought it was interesting, especially on Mother's Day when we're thinking about the things we hold dear. Yeah. Right. The things we hold dear are the things that we protect and cultivate. Mm -hmm. Right. As parents, we hold our children dear. We protect and cultivate it. So it really struck me that that black cloud of guilt is what we hold dear, meaning we don't just have an awareness that it's there, we actually cultivate and protect it. That's right. You know, and That's so right. that awareness That's that right. we're defending our right to guilt by cultivating and protecting it and making it more valuable to us, which means it's a thing which we have to desire at that time. You hold it dear. Yeah. Just like I said, you, you hold it dear. That's why you cultivate it. You really think it's going to make you a good person. It's something precious to you. And it's precious to you. That's why I, I share a lot of times with parents. You know, be as loving as you, and nurturing as you can to your child, but also remember you didn't create your child. That the divine created your child. And also... That your child is a soul that has its own spiritual path. And it's going to follow that path no matter how good a parent you are. So I think sometimes parents blame themselves too much for the way their children turn out as if their children didn't have their own soul lesson when they came here. 
And so they said, oh, if I gave them, if I, I, how many of you all have known people have, that have grown up in what the world would call the perfect family? They had the mother, they had the father, they wasn't poor, they were fed, and they turned out to be serial killers, mm -hmm. right? And then you've seen other people, probably like you, who grew up in what people would call a dysfunctional home, and you sitting in the class trying to see how you can be loving. But if, you, but if we knew what you went through in childhood, we'd be running out the door when you came in, right? In terms of the way, in terms of how screwed up you ought to be based on your parenting. But you're the one that's sitting up here saying, I want to, so I'm just saying, those things do not guarantee anything. It doesn't guarantee. The see, she's letting me know that I'm telling the truth <laughs> and she, that I'm saying exactly what she needs to be said. Input. That's right. She got a lot of input. <laughs> she was coming to the class even before she was out the body. So she's used to hearing my voice. Okay. Anybody else about that paragraph? Yeah, I still see in myself, you know, when I get into guilt um, and then I, you know, read and, you know, try to understand it, I still see in myself that desire to hold on to it because that's the way I feel alive. Uh, you're holding it dear, you're cultivating it, you get the punishment, you get the challenge in life, and then you get mad about it. See, that doesn't make any sense. If I'm still <laughs> continuing to hold dear the guilt, why am I still getting upset when I, I'm experiencing the results of it, which is a life that it looks like I'm going through a lot of challenges. Right? It would be better to go, I'm holding the guilt, so I'm going to take responsibility for holding the guilt, which means I'm going to take responsibility for the experiences that ensue. And then I still wouldn't be so upset. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to put my hand on the hot stove, and now I'm burned. Yeah. Now, why should I be getting upset about the burn? Why don't I accept responsibility? I knowingly put my hand on the hot stove again. So what am I doing getting mad about it? I knew it was a hot stove. They told me it was a hot stove. I continue to put myself, my hands on the hot stove. Then you get to the point that people who are conscious around you, they stop giving you input. That's right. and, it, and you get to the point that you just will not say that to that person one more time. That's right. You just look. You just look. And, I just watch, and then I just start watching Peter burn his hand. And I don't have anything else to say about Peter burning his hand. Why? Because I'm going to honor Right. Peter's freedom to burn his hand because I, I told him it's a hot stove right, right. so you may be at that point in your experience when it looks like friends and relatives give up on you a lot of times it's not that they're giving up on you they just see you consciously choosing to make the same choices over and over so at some point they honor that by no longer getting involved and then you feel resentful Right. but they're not doing anything to you. They see you continuing to make the same choice. I have several great <laughs> online comments. Okay, cool. Um, we so love online comments. Diana, first, I'm going to pull two of her comments together. She says, uh, I have a memory from early childhood of a relative looking at me sternly and telling me to be ashamed of myself. She has telling you to be ashamed right. of yourself. Right. And so then she followed that up by saying, Holy Spirit, I am willing to commit to eradicating my guilt with you. Thank you. Yeah. And then, uh, Kathy, I love this. Uh, she said, Dear Guilt, please serve the next table as I have changed my dietary needs and don't eat you anymore. <laughs> That's guilt free dieting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, I, it's like I, I, there's a restaurant that I go to that they know me so well that they'll bring me a raspberry tea sometimes without me even asking for it, right? But suppose I'm through with raspberry tea. Then when they bring it, I have to say, No. Now I want milk. You see what I'm saying? So when you change your mind and you say, I'm not going to feed my guilt, it's going to still they're gonna, it's gonna still be showing up for a while. And you're going to have to go, no, I'm not, this is not what I want anymore. So it, just because you say you're ready to see yourself as innocent, it doesn't mean your old order isn't going to keep showing up. What's the other one? And then Jerry says, guilt is the bedrock that keeps everything in place. It's time to break up the bedrock. It's time to break up the bedrock. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you know what's so cool about it? Everyone has a limit. Mm -hmm. Some people have more limits than others, obviously. <laughs> but everyone has a limit to pain. Everyone has a limit to pain. So you don't have to worry about it. 
sooner or later, they're going to go, there must be a better way. They may not even do it in this lifetime. That's right. You might see people born in the body and die in the body and never seem to change anything. Mm -hmm. But they will. So you, you, we'll be, see, we are not taught about the eternal validity of the soul. Right. So we think we only exist in this little short period of time, which I thought was as a child was the most unfair thing I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. Was that some people are born what appears to be with bo bodily challenges. Some people are born with, in, with riches and some kids are born with nothing, but they had one life to all equally get it right. Yeah. And that, see, that kind of stuff didn't make sense to me even as a child. And I couldn't understand why it made sense to adults. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It, it, that anybody with any kind of sense ought to know that no fair creator would start everybody off unequal yeah. and uneven, but they, got to, but they all have to be perfected all. So basically people throw out reason when it comes to religious and spiritual beliefs. Mm -hmm. They throw it out. So, um, with the blamelessness, I think, um, and you've talked about this before, and I'm seeing like the craziness of this too, is this idea that to be blameless um, involves sacrifice. That, that, that's crazy, that, the idea of sacrifice. Well, if I, if I give up what I value, give up what I love, give up everything that matters to me, somehow or another, you know, that is somehow good for me. To sacrifice everything I love is somehow going to make me more loving. All that's going to do is make me resent you. You keep telling me I need to sacrifice everything that makes my life meaningful to me. That's going to be a, a father who works 70 hours a week to feed his family, who loves his family, does not see that as a sacrifice. See, sacrifice is a perception. It's not a reality. It's only a sacrifice if I call it that. It's a sacrifice to teach this class if I call it a sacrifice and then I resent it. I love teaching, so I never see it as a sacrifice. See, love never sacrifices because love doesn't feel like it's losing by giving. Only fear-based minds believe in sacrifice because they, they, they believe that life is about you doing what you don't want to do all the time. So this was awesome. So without guilt, fear, or the ego has no life, and you, God's child, you, who you really are, is without guilt. So let's acknowledge ourselves for even letting ourselves be going to hear this. And, uh, and I hope I said something that triggered you, because if I said something that triggered you, all I did was expose some core belief that you have that you need to take a look at. Spiritual growth is going to involve some triggering. It's no way you're going to grow spiritually and have your old beliefs that limit you challenged and not have some contraction. That's all right. It's cool. I was glad. Thank you, those of you online who were also making comments. So let's, we're going to do the financial expression of appreciation right now. Thank you for sharing. That's all I have to say about that. Okay. Uh, those of you who would like to go deeper in your healing process and you would like someone to work with you on that, that's been doing this for almost 40 years, that's me. So I'm available for one-on-one -on -one sessions called Clarity Sessions. And I will show you, from working with many people, how to get past your blocks if you're open to it and can save you some time. The Course in Miracles says the purpose of a relationship should be to save you time. Not delay you, but to save you time. Parents out there, how many times have you wished that your children would listen to you because you could have saved them so much pain or sorrow or time in some way? Because of what? Your greater wisdom, your greater experience. And that's not going to hinder their ability to have the lessons that they need, but you know you could save them some time. So that's all I'm saying. If you're interested in the course and you're interested in changing your mind using this material, I can save you some time. I can help you in that way because there are no original problems. And, uh, and so also, thank you those of you who share. I teach full time. I have the same needs in the world that you have. So I appreciate you valuing what I do enough to share financially with me. And you're totally innocent if you don't. But I just want you to know I really appreciate the fact that you see value in what I do.
enough to share. Because let's face it, we put our money where we value it. Okay. We all do it. We all do it. And um, I'm, I, I'm the same out of love of God, so I'm going to be all right anyway. But I just want you to think about that. That what you value, you invest in and you support. You know, action speaks louder than words. Mm -hmm. And we're all innocent. Because it's not anything I haven't done either. There's no, that's what I love. It's not anything anyone does to me that I don't go, I'm looking at my past. <laughs> I don't care what it is. I go, you've done this. Whatever you're looking at, you've done it. And people say, I've never murdered anybody. Ask those fleas and flies. That. <laughs> okay, uh, it, you know, you killed something. You know, we all, there's nothing anybody that's in the world has done because there's only two things we're doing. We either, we're either loving or we're doing something that's a call for love, that's a call for help. That's the truth. So could anybody, uh, also, um, I'm doing Facebook Live classes, and I got a Facebook Live class that I do on Tuesday. It's called The Way of Mastery at 7 o'clock Mountain Time. Thank you. Thursdays at 7 o'clock uh, Mountain Time, I do the Hardcore Course in Miracles on Facebook Live. And, of course, this class is being broadcast on Facebook Live, too, at 1 o'clock Mountain Time. You don't have to be a member of Facebook. You do not have to be a Facebook member to watch these live interactive broadcasts. People are coming and asking questions and communicating with each other as I'm doing this. All you have to do is go to the link. And the link is www.facebook.com forward slash Earl Purdy Live. And you can watch the classes from wherever you are, if you want other people to check it out. Uh, we had a great, powerful relationship workshop yesterday that was mind-boggling in terms of, in every way. We talked about everything <laughs> that you can think about relative. We, see, uh, Carl and I did it together, and we were, in, in, in the last night we were saying to each other, did we say that? <laughs> and did we say that? <laughs> And did we say that? Because we went for it. Yeah. And um, because we want to work with people who are ready to e evolve in their relationships. Because we want to. So it was great. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. And I'm grateful to everybody that came. Especially grateful to Carla for her contribution mm -hmm. to it. You know, Thank you. And uh, it, it, it makes us more sane in our communication and relationship <laughs> with each other. Because you teach best what you most need to learn. You want to know what you should be teaching, what you're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. You'll be focused. It's awesome. So, a one takeaway from today's talk is what? From anybody? Yeah. Guilt is not something I should treasure. Guilt is <laughs> not something you should treasure. Good thought. Thank you. Yes. Guilt and love can't coexist. Guilt and love. I, I, I'm not full of guilt and loving you in that moment. Right. That's right. I'm actually angry. Yeah. Chris. And it's only a sacrifice if I ha have a lot of value towards it. Like yeah. If I really value it, then it's a, it's a sacrifice. It's, it's a, it a sacrifice. Okay. You, you see it as a sacrifice if you're feeling resentment or you think you're losing or you think you're doing something that you really don't want to do. So sacrifice is really the idea of I'm losing through what I'm doing. I'm not giving myself peace through it. It's not the... It's, that's really important. Sacrifice isn't the thing you're doing. It's the attitude you have about the thing you're doing. That's what makes it a sacrifice. Okay? Everybody clear about that? Okay. Kim. I, I would like to change my guilty affirmations to more positive affirmations to get a positive change in my life. That's right. You want to tell yourself something different from what you've told yourself. You know what? You don't even have to figure what that is. Right? You don't have to figure it out. This is what's so good about having a spiritual path. It means that you have it already in here. It's already in here. You heard it today. You heard a lot of stuff today that you could tell yourself, oh, I'm feeling guilty. Oh, I'm not giving myself love right now. Oh, I'm listening to my ego. That's all you have to do. Tell yourself the truth. That's it. Tell yourself the truth. I'm also, I'm not sure if I did it right, but okay. I'm also feeling like I can't, be vulnerable, I can't allow myself to be vulnerable in the moment if I'm choosing to be guilty. Mm -hmm. That's um, right. Mm -hmm. you know, I Absolutely. Can't, I can't open to you. No. Someone else or myself even. Right, and, and, I'm, and if I'm not feeling love, I'm not giving it. 
So if I'm, so if I'm feeling contraction and guilty, I can't feel your love. So it's really keeping me from knowing love. Yeah, and, okay. This is a present moment, you know, where I'm constantly in that mm -hmm. aspect of, oh, I can't be vulnerable because I'm fearful or yes. I'm using guilt. Yes. We're not here. We're in this monkey mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, Diana said, you know, that she's taking, that she can know that she is healing because she's letting go of the guilt as her early childhood experiences are coming up. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hey. Anybody else? Kind of like that. But I just think that it's interesting that you said that it's like we go back in time, the further into our spirituality we get, because that makes so much sense. That like feeling of wanting to die, or feeling like you're going to die because like your whole world is unraveling. That's it's right. It's good to know that's a good sign. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm over here like, oh my god, everything's unraveling. Yeah, most people, most people think progress <laughs> means you're only feeling yeah. good about yeah. every Light, step of the path, but actually, progress means you are actually confronting, you're looking at it. Like I say things in this class to me that's in this book that's so outrageous in terms of what we're being taught, I always wonder, why is nobody reacting to what I just said? <laughs> it, it, because they didn't hear it. I can always tell when people hear something I'm saying, because it generally trigger some type of reaction. Even if it's the reaction of, I don't like it, what I heard. Or the reaction of, oh wow, that was cool. But to be told that any guilt that you feel about anything is the opposite of love, Unless you've been working on yourself spiritually, that should be made you go, hmm, what? You mean that person that was in nine, you know, the the, the pilots in nine one one? What's what they call not nine nine eleven? Was that that you? And that's, they're not supposed to feel guilty about that. You know, it would tend to bring up something if you're hearing radically opposite things from what you were taught. So just pay attention to: Am I really, really, really present? Am I really, really hearing that I'm totally innocent, totally blameless, totally guiltless? And, 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 and if I really heard this today, then I really don't want to be around people who are constantly projecting on me, criticizing me, telling me I'm guilty. So it begin to tell you the type of people you should be around, what you should be telling yourself what your goals should be. If you really heard this today and you walked out the door and you were making yourself feel guilty, you would go, okay, even if I'm still feeling guilty, I know I'm listening to the wrong voice. Even though, even though my emotional reaction still may be to feel guilt, I still, and now I am aware this is not moving in the right direction. So move toward the people who see your innocence and away from the people who constantly put guilt trips on you because you deserve to be happy all you yeah. mothers. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. Thanks for coming out, y'all. Y'all cool. It's all right to give it to us. If nobody else will, we can. We can do it. Thank you so much, y'all. Hugs are available. Have a great Mother's Day. Those of you online, I love you. Have a great Mother's Day. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Come back anytime. I had a really great experience last Friday. You know, when we were talking.